Hi, I'm Frances Katzen and welcome to my podcast, The World of Real Estate. In this series, we will explore the world's largest asset class and how it plays out on a global scale. So I've never quite done this before where I've actually decided to share one of our reports. The Katzen Report is a widely distributed online newsletter that we've created that speaks to real-time issues happening in the life and the glamorous life and not so glamorous life of real estate and brokerage. So today's topic is conflicting messages, assessing the state of the New York real estate market. Boy, that's a dinner topic, isn't it? Despite trading near historical highs, there seems to be a feeling of uneasiness in the global markets. Hmm, really? Yeah. Volatility has become the norm, and most believe it is here to stay. Not so sure about that. Whether it's the trade war with China, uncertain Fed policy, the impeachment inquiry, Brexit, recession fears, or all the potential for market-unfriendly presidential election results, there is no shortage of concern. My focus is narrower in scope. And is the topic of this month's Katzen Report. What's the state of play in the New York City real estate market, given broader market uncertainties? Hopefully, this report proves timely as we enter a traditionally busy season in the year and in real estate markets, particularly given the weakness in the third quarter numbers just released. Yay! In formulating a view, admittedly, my crystal ball is as cloudy as most. I've looked at the numbers and historical trends, coupled with an overlay of what I'm seeing on the ground in real time. I believe neither can be viewed in isolation, and I think that's really important, as the numbers, for example, while interesting, often turn out to be lagging indicators and poor predictors of what's to come. Things such as feedback from buyers and sellers, the tone of negotiations, boy, I tell you, the tone is real. Numbers of bidders and open traffic, or lack thereof, can shed important light on future numbers and real market conditions. The New York Times report recently that one in four of New York City's new luxury apartments is unsold. Ouch. They cite the most troubling signs include the growing share of condos sold in recent years being quietly relisted as rentals by investors who bought but are reluctant to put them back on the resale market and extended timelines to sell new product versus years past. Well, while growing inventory certainly is a concern and has been highlighted ad nauseum in recent years, I think the one in four ratio is as good as one realistically could expect given the absolutely explosive growth in new development. As a result, the historical paradigm of what is acceptable in terms of sellout timelines and remaining inventory as construction completion has to be redefined and built into developers, new costs, their pricing, and the return expectations. Otherwise, we, the brokers, are really in trouble. However, it's also important to look at the numbers at a more micro level and focus on trends project by project rather than just the headline numbers. For example, a portion of unsold new development inventory is in less than prime location and or outer boroughs where developers bet on continued gentrification and Manhattan sprawl. In addition, a number of projects in prime locations and at the right price points are doing quite well. I think there's a give and take to that. I'm living it. Finally, there are continued signs of race to the bottom via developer price cuts and increased sales incentives in certain segments of the market, ripping off the band-aid, as I call it, and pricing it to fair value, while painful for some in the near term could be a long-term positive as remaining inventory stays either sold or, depending on the supply and demand dynamics, recalibrate. Then there is the demand side of the equation. According to CNBC, the rich aren't spending. That's what they say. They report that a sudden pullback in spending among the wealthy could cascade down to the rest of the economy and create a further drag on growth high-end real estate is having, since they're having its worst year since the financial crisis. Luxury retailers are struggling while discounters like Walmart and Target thrive. And in the half of 2019, art auction sales were down for the first time in years. Douglas Elliman's Q2 and Q3 data further clouds the picture. Q2 numbers appear to corroborate a potential bottoming with slightly higher average sale prices from Q2. Don't you find that your head's spinning a little bit? Stay with me. It comes to a level. So Q2 
2018 to Q2 2019 was really not that much of a gloom and doom difference. In fact, the median price of $2 million increased only to $2 million. That's a $5,000 difference, which really means that the potential bottoming out is not so inherent. And the price per square foot went from $17.33 a foot in 2018 to 1762 a foot. I can imagine that we would all agree that's not that much of a of a difference. However, and what further suggests supporting that number is the 12.5% increase in the number of units that closed in 2018 to 2019. In 2018, we had 2,629 units closed. And in 2019, we had 2,957. I think this gloom and doom discussion is actually a little bit hyped up. Look at the facts. However, material shifts like this sometimes can be driven by shocks that make the trend, inverted commas, harder to extrapolate. In this case, New York City's progressive increase in the mansion tax took effect on July 1st of this year and the first day of the third quarter. How lucky are we? As a result, one can speculate that a number of buyers, particularly at the higher end, which are hardest hit by the mansion tax because it goes up so much more than 1%, accelerated closings to avoid the higher tax bill. Everybody was trying to close before July 1st. Given that the numbers mentioned in the reports are average versus median prices, a few large outliers at the high end could move the numbers meaningfully. Therefore, my guess is Q2 numbers may be a bit better than they would have been otherwise, while Q3 may have been skewed more negatively. Either way, I think the next few quarters will be very informative as to the steady state trend in prices and volume now that mansion tax has fully phased in. Then there are fears of recession and what this might mean for real estate performance. There is no shortage of recession debate, with many assuming economic headwinds will be offset by President Trump. Crystal clear realization that the economy is critical to his re-election hopes. Not so sure. As such, his top priority will be preventing economic weakness, even if this means actions like striking a deal with China that is less than deemed ideal. After all, as the statistician and election predictor Nate Silver points out, the last incumbent president to face a recession in an election year was Jimmy Carter in 1980 when he lost to Reagan in a landslide. However, rather than debate whether the U.S. economy is headed towards a recession and if so, when, let's focus on how real estate has performed during the past recessions. As tempting as it might be to look at the 2008 financial crisis for guidance on how future recession may look, this could prove misleading. Remember, real estate and more specifically lax lending standards and extreme leverage in both households and the financial system were at the heart of the Great Recession. Jonathan Miller is quoted in a recent Brick Underground article saying, conditions in this time are different and housing isn't a leading force as it was during the subprime crisis. Last year, it was all about leverage. This time, it's about affordability. Atom Data Solutions, a leading real estate data provider, examined home pricings during the five recessions since 1980 and found out that only in 1990 and 2008 did home prices actually come down during the recession. Huh. And in 1990, it, it was by less than a percent. During the other three, home pricing actually rose. Aaron Tarasas, Zillow's director of economic research, wrote, People's income gets squeezed in a downturn, but they still need a place to live. Usually what that means is that they are still in the market if they need to be, and if there is one, but their price point is lower. While history doesn't always repeat itself, it's certainly a good reminder that one should not simply assume real estate will perform poorly during periods of economic weakness. So now, let's put the numbers and history aside and turn to what I've seen in the market since late summer. After a surprising busy August, I've seen a further increase in traffic. Yeah, I have, at a number of properties post Labor Day. In particular, there have been noticeable pickup in activity in the two to $5 million sector. While the luxury market remains sluggish, I have found pockets of demand materializing. I really have. In addition, first-time buyers are dipping their toes back into the water, which is an encouraging sign As I've said before, this segment of the market often is the first to exit and the last to return, given they often have the most to lose. Thus, I watch these buyers closely for what may be a leading indicator of things to come. 
Finally, I've seen the continuation of a trend, and I've noticed for quite some time empty nesters leave the suburbs for the convenience and limited maintenance of New York City living. You see, New York has a pool. So what's driving this activity? Honestly, some of the prevalent comments I've heard from buyers are real estate as an asset class now offers attractive relative value following its underperformance versus equities since 2015. Prices finally may be bottoming or reducing following the potential seller capitulation mentioned above. Now, many sellers simply will take their product off the market rather than cut prices further. I'm telling you, that's going to happen if we don't realize that this is the most opportunistic time. Either renting it or delaying their relocation plans altogether. In practice, I have witnessed this behavior many times. I really have. Lower interest rates since the beginning of the year, example, the 10-year treasury has fallen by over... 100 basis points, has increased affordability while most impactful in the non-luxury market, many high-end buyers that otherwise would pay all cash are now using some leverage as they see value in how mortgage rates compare to other investment alternatives. If you have the opportunity to get cheap leverage, you can diversify and put it back into the market. Whether you agree or disagree, a case certainly can be made for each. There is no doubt that real estate market still faces a number of challenges, whether it's excess supply, increased taxes and transaction costs, affordability or economic uncertainty. However, I am quite pleased to see signs of increased activity and buyers seeing solid value in the product that they once viewed as overpriced. I'm looking forward to a busy fourth quarter, one which will be quite telling in terms of expectations for 2020. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for tuning in to the world of real estate. Please be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with my latest episodes. 